Today, as we come to the table. Now you need to tailor your message oftentimes depending on the crowd you're in front of, but the message has still got to be there. And again, when you're free from this respecter of people or fear of man, it's very liberating. It sets you free to not only be who you should be, but also to be a witness for the Lord, not caring what people think. The bottom line is, what if somebody doesn't like you? What if a bunch of people don't like you? It doesn't matter as long as Jesus likes you. And when you stand before him on that day, again, that's going to be the one, as I said, you're going, you're going to want to like you. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We spend far too much of our energy and resources on trying to get the approval and favor of other people. Not only does it cost us emotionally and financially, it has a deep spiritual impact as well. As Pastor Mark will remind us in today's message, there's only one place we should be looking for that approval. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. It's infinitely more valuable to have God's approval than that of men. Sadly, you likely find yourself compromising on what you know pleases God in order to look good to your peers. Instead of focusing on those horizontal relationships, your focus needs to shift to the one who loves you and redeems your soul for eternity. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Galatians chapter 2 as he begins his message, No Respecter of Persons. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Galatians chapter 2. As we're looking at verses 6 through 10 in Galatians chapter 2, let's read this together. Galatians chapter 2, verse 6 says this, But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to any man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter and for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised." They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now, today we look at no respecter of persons. Now, remember the setting here. Paul is fighting against those trying to bring the law into Galatia. Paul has planted all these churches in Galatia. Those that are in Galatia that have the Jewish background of the law are trying to bring the law in and saying, yes, you can have Jesus, but you also need to follow the law. And Paul is saying, nonsense. You have Jesus and you're free from the law. And so he's fighting these guys. And in order for them to be able to win their argument in Galatia, they had to tear Paul down. They had to tell them Paul's not really authoritative. Paul's not really the guy you think he is. Paul's just reiterating everything they're saying in Jerusalem. And Paul's just going, he's basically a puppet of those guys. And all kinds of accusations flying against Paul. And Paul, again, because of this, jumps into his testimony you know, that he had with the, with the Lord, his credentials in Jesus, and making the argument against these legalists and why he has this authority from God. And as he continues this theme, he's going to be talking about the fact that as we're called to share the gospel, we're not to be respecter of persons. And that really goes right in line with the fear of man. That is, no matter who they are, God calls us to preach the gospel clearly and in truth. And God calls us to share the gospel and and not to be afraid to do that. And so, again, uh, this is a great place for all of us to be where our only concern is God and what he thinks about us, not what people think. The only one that really matters is Jesus. And when you stand before the Lord on that day, which I believe is going to be very soon for all of us as he comes for his church, you're not going to care what people thought about you. I'm not talking about being rude and being disrespectful. I'm talking about I don't care what people think about me. I've got to do what God has called me to do. 
In whatever level of ability or calling you have, do it with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength because you're going to be answerable to the Lord. It will be God we ultimately answer to and not people. And knowing this, how foolish it is to be overly concerned about what people think, even some of the most important people in the world. And maybe you found yourself in a position where you've been around important people. I have from time to time. And typically, I, I, I've learned now by this time, if I get around important people, say as little as possible. Because I find that when I say much of anything, it comes out being something really dumb. And so I try to say, just don't just, nice to meet you. Smile real big and just honor you or whatever, this kind of thing. And leave it alone. Because again, uh, you, you, know, you get nervous and you say things you shouldn't say. You know, where does that nervousness come from? At the, we, we have a fear of man. We see certain people as great and other people not as great. That's why we run up to get the autograph. That's why we do all the things that we do. That's why we, as little kids, hang the poster on the wall, you know, this kind of thing. And it's because, you know, we, you know we, we have this fear of man and this respect of man, and there should be a respect of certain people in certain positions. But again, when it comes to serving in the go- Jesus Christ and the gospel, we should fear no man, have no respect of people. And whether I'm standing before you or in front of the world leaders, I should be able to say the same thing. Now, you need to tailor your message oftentimes depending on the crowd you're in front of, but the message has still got to be there. And again, when you're free from this respecter of people or fear of man, it's very liberating. It sets you free to not only be who you should be, but also to be a witness for the Lord, not caring what people think. You think about it, the bottom line is, what if somebody doesn't like you? What if a bunch of people don't like you? It doesn't matter as long as Jesus likes you. And when you stand before him on that day, again, that's going to be the one, as I said, you're going, you're going to want to like you. Proverbs 29, 25 says this, the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And I was telling Tracy just this week, you know, even though we understand that we're not to fear man, and God has brought me a long way, and I don't have some great fear of man that I know of now, but I still find in certain situations I can feel this pressure not to do what I know I need to do. And I'm like, what is that? That's really a respecter of persons and a fear of man. And although we know it in our mind, although we know it in our heart, we've got to say, God, deliver me from that. And again, some of you don't have that problem because you never did care what anybody thinks, and you'll be glad to tell them, right? Different personalities. And yet some of you are so tied up in what people think that if you say one wrong thing and you think they may not like you as much anymore, it haunts you all week. So see, there's extremes both ways. We have to go to the Lord and say, God... I need, I need to fear only you, and I need to respect only you in the sense of you're the one that I'm trying to please. Let me be faithful to do what it is that you've called me to do and not to fear anyone, even if I respect them and even if I should respect them, and there are people that we should respect, not to have a fear of them. I read a, a, about a little boy this week who uh, uh, was in a, a, a lightning storm one summer night, severe thunderstorm. He had his mother tucking him into bed, and as she was about to turn out the light, the boy, fearing and trembling, said to her, Mommy, will you stay with me tonight? Smiling, the mother gave him a warm, reassuring hug and said tenderly, I can't, dear. I have to sleep in Daddy's room tonight. And a long silence followed. And with a furrowed brow and a a broken, small, shaky voice, he said, that big sissy. (laughs) He no doubt respected his dad, but he was still going to say what he needed to say. And what a lesson that is for us. We're to respect those that we respect, but we need to say what we need to say. We're not to be respecters of position. We're We're to be respecters of position as far as men's right before God, but we fear God. And Paul was a man who feared no one but God. And again, that should be our goal as well. And this is what Paul now is going to lay out to them as Paul continues his argument here about not letting the legalists in. And again, diffusing the arguments that he was simply just, you know, uh, that he was like not being approved of by those in Jerusalem. He's going to show that not only did he not fear those men in Jerusalem, but he was approved of them. They agreed to link hands with him in ministry. And that's the argument he's going to make with them now. So he's building this whole case from many different avenues uh, as he goes through this in Galatians. And in verse 6, he says, but from those who seemed to be something. Now, he'll say that more than once. I, I think that's interesting. Paul's making a point. You know, they seem to be somebody important. Whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. And so, in other words, although they seemed like they were very important, it was Jesus that I got everything I needed from. Again, they didn't add anything to me. You know, I can't add anything to you. I can share with you what the Lord said and what the Word of God says. But all I'm doing is passing on His message. I can't add to it. 
I don't have revelation from heaven. I'm not going to speak the word of God fresh from heaven apart from the scripture to you. And so Paul is saying, you know, these guys, I, I, they don't, they're not a concern to me in that sense because I look to Jesus and I love his settled confidence in his personal faith in the Lord and his call uh, from God and, and his relationship to other believers. What Paul is saying is, I don't care about these guys. If they're supposed to be somebody important in the church, whether they're disciples and walk with Jesus or not, that's great. I'm so happy for them. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to bow down to them. That doesn't mean that I think they're so great and so special that now I'm holding them above the Lord. I'm glad there's representatives. I'm glad they're talking with the, you know, with sharing the gospel and we can work side by side. But we're in this thing together. And really, that's a mindset we've got to have, not just among those who might seem to be important in, in many people's eyes in ministry, but us in the body of Christ. We're working together in this thing, guys. This is a team effort. And we're here serving the Lord and what God has called us to do. I think uh, one of the things that's amazed me in the South, and maybe it's not just the South. I, growing up as a pastor's son in the South, and now being a pastor myself, it, what I've seen from the inside and from the outside, from two different perspectives of being in a pastor's family and now being a pastor, there's a tremendous amount of competition among churches in the South. And what do I mean by that? Everybody wants to be the important one and nobody's really quick to work together and doing things together because it's they're not their church or not their event or not their this and that. And again, I, I understand human nature, but here's the bottom line. We are all in this thing together and that is Paul's argument. It reminds me of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah built his wall, Nehemiah didn't say, now everybody in, you'll stay back, let me build the whole wall. He said, look, I need help in this and I want every family to go build the wall that's right in front of them. Go build that wall. And every family came out and they built the wall right in front of them. Then this family built the wall right in front of them. And as they all worked together, they did a mighty work for God in that city working together as a team. That's how we should be as the church. That's how we should be working together as believers. We're in this together. And so again, there's no reason for competition because each one of us are called to build a different portion of the wall. There's a portion of the wall that Severe Heights is supposed to build. And God bless them. It's a great work of God. I pray for them often as I drive by. And there's a work, there's a portion of the wall that God has called us at Calvary Chapel to do, whether it be radio or whether it be reaching out to the bikers or the veteran. Everybody has their different part of the wall they're supposed to build. And the way it works is as we all build our portion of the wall together, the wall gets complete. And it's a work of God that's unified. And so this is where Paul is saying to them, look, I, these guys didn't set me up. They didn't separate themselves from me and say, well, now Paul's going to the Gentiles. We want nothing to do with him. No, Paul is a part of the family of God. And while we're going to the Jews, he's going to the Gentiles. And we've linked up in ministry together. And so Paul wants them to know that he has the support, even as he's giving his credentials. These are further credentials of the support he has from those in, in Jerusalem, while at the same time saying, well, while they, while they link up and while there's support for me, I don't look to them. They're not the ones that gave me what I'm, the message I'm sharing. The Lord gave me that. And so I respect them. I love them, Paul would say, but it's Jesus who is a perfect, righteous Lord and King of all that I honor. And by the way, he's the creator of all things and he alone will be the one that I will one day be accountable to and the one day that you will one day be accountable to. It's, it's Jesus. And so Paul had everything in proper perspective when oftentimes we don't. We look at people and their earthly achievements and give them praise. Paul looked at Jesus and said, he alone gets the praise. And any gift that someone has, God gave them. I'll give you an example, you know, just somebody that has an amazing gift. Okay, think in your mind of someone that has an amazing gift. I'm not gonna name a name, just think of someone. Now, whether it's in the church or out of the church, where did they get that? God gave that to them. The Bible's clear. They didn't just like, they didn't just like will it to themselves. They didn't just like, you know, uh, you know, win the DNA lottery. Right? God said, I'm choosing you to have that, you to have that, you to have that, you to have that. And then each person can develop that gift the way they want by, by, by devoting their life to it or whatever they're going to do. But the ultimate reason that God gives anyone a gift is to bring him glory. So what we're going to be judged on that day is not how many, you know, not, not that we could do a 360 slam dunk and be MVP six straight times or whatever. I'm not picking on anybody. The bottom line is, what did you do with that for Jesus? Not that I can sing and win all the awards and have the number one album for this many times or whatever. Not that I can be this or, or be a, a pastor that fills stadiums with great crusades. The question is, was that for you or was that for God? What, what are we doing with it and are we doing it for the Lord? That's what we're gonna be judged by. So Paul's saying, look, I'm not impressed with any man uh, as far as what they can do. I'm impressed with the Lord. Men are sinners. 
And so I'm no respecter of persons. I'm not intimidated by them. I'm not impressed by them. And so oftentimes, you know, we get introduced, uh, when people get introduced, you know, I don't know if you've been to these events where somebody gets up and they have this big introduction of them and they go on this whole litany of how great they are and all these things they've done. There's nothing wrong, again, in acknowledging someone's achievement. I think that's appropriate at times. I'm not downing that. But is it simply a thing where you're lifting the person up and giving them all the glory? And I'm speaking of Christian events. Is it, all, is it about that person or is it about Jesus? Paul would say, look, I, 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 it doesn't matter to me. These men seemed to be something to everyone else. He said, it didn't add anything to me. It wasn't any big deal to me. I didn't walk with them. I met them afterwards. That Jesus taught me everything I, I was taught out in Saudi Arabia. And so I learned it all from him. And so, again, doesn't add to me. Verse 7, but on the contrary, when they saw the gospel for the uncircumcised that had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, there's the third time he said that, that they seemed to be somebody, now he calls them pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also desired to do. And notice he says, on the contrary, when they saw the anointing from God and the fruit in our lives concerning the ministry to the Gentiles, they realized it was no less than God that had given uh, them to go to the Jews and us to go to the Gentiles. In other words, we're equals, different calls. We're building different parts of the wall. Their part of the wall was to go reach the Jews. Our part of the wall was to go reach the Gentiles. And while really our part is to reach everyone, there's a focus that God will give us. You can't meet every need that's out there. You can't witness to every person that needs to be witnessed to. You know, as a church, we get a lot of people that say, would you like to donate or give to our missions organization? And we're giving, we're increasing our missions giving every year, just so you guys know. And we're starting to show them during the, before the services. If you're in here early enough, you'll see up on the screen, we're showing the different missions that we're giving to and being a part of, because we want to be giving back and being, investing in the kingdom of God and not just in taking in, so to speak, and putting it back out there. But the bottom line is, as we, as we do that, And as we grow in that, we're simply trying to just be the witness that God has called us to be and to reach people in a more effective way. And and, and again, not to lift up our name, but we can't reach them all. We can't, people contact, you know, can you be a part of this? Can you support that person? We have to pray. And so which ones do you want us to support? Which ones do you want us to give to? Because it's overwhelming. The needs are overwhelming. But this is why God has given all of us a part to do. I'll give this to you on a personal level. Are you doing your part in Calvary Chapel? What has God called you to do? There are probably people here at Calvary Chapel that are busier doing their ministry than they're supposed to be because you're supposed to be helping them. Now, I don't know who you are or whether you felt the conviction of God's spirit. Maybe God's been putting something on your heart for a long time and you just haven't done it because you know what, ah, that's covered or I really don't want to get involved. And God is saying, yeah, this servant is faithful. They'll keep doing it, but I've called you to help them. And now they're carrying a double load because you want. But if you'll help them, their load will be easier and you will have eternal reward. So there's a great motivation and understanding that we work together as a team. And so Paul is saying, notice they gave me the right hand of fellowship. Now it's interesting, the right hand, that's the hand of strength in the scripture. Fellowship is the word koinonia, which means close, intimate friendship. And so what is Paul saying? They're giving me a strong hand of fellowship. We're not separate. We're doing different ministries, but we work together in teamwork in this ministry. And I do that with James and with John and with Peter. We're we're clasping hands together as equals and serving together to show the Galatians that Paul wasn't some lone ranger, but the church at large supported him. And so I find it interesting. Notice he says they seem to be pillars. Uh, That's interesting because they would have all understood that. And pillars were everywhere in the Middle East. You go back and look at the ruins today. There are pillars everywhere. And pillars were in in, in just building after building over there. And more importantly, there were pillars even in the temple. And in Solomon's temple, there were these pillars that were there in the front of it. And the the, the word here uh, and action that they appeared to be pillars, uh, in some way, again, these leaders of the church were pillars in that they were the founding, you know, the ones that were there, the, the ones founding fathers and getting the church to its start, if you will. But again, it would have given them in their mind a picture of Solomon's temple. Because Solomon's temple had these two pillars that stood out front by themselves. And again, they even gave them a name. Uh, They were there for beauty and for looks. They called them Jachin and Boaz. Jachin means he will establish. 
Boab means fleetness and strength. And I think that is God will establish his church and his people. Fleetness means God, you will, they'll move rapidly in strength. Fleetness and strength and being a witness for the Lord. They were symbols of God's established and strong temple and family. But that's all they were. They were simply symbols because these pillars had nothing on them. They stood alone by themselves out front at the doorway. There was not, They weren't holding up any of the building whatsoever. And what was Paul's point in this? And what is my point? Even as they were visible pillars for beauty at the entrance of the temple, in reality, they held nothing up. And what Paul is saying is, look, these guys are beautiful believers. They're Jacob and Boaz. And I'm glad for that. We need to see their example and follow their example. But they're not holding up the temple. Jesus is the pillar that's holding up the temple. Don't put too much emphasis on his servants. Put the emphasis on him. And so, again, how foolish to be starstruck or impressed by anyone. It's the Lord that we're to be starstruck and impressed about, if you will. And notice, lastly, Paul says, when they saw his call to the Gentiles, even as they were called to the Jews, they quickly linked up ministry together. The only thing they requested is that they remembered the poor among them, which Paul said he was eager to do. And Paul was eager to do this. Why did they stress that they took care of the poor? Because specifically in Jerusalem, the church had gone poor. They'd gone broke. Why? What happened? If you remember back in Acts, it tells us that when the church, the early church was so on fire for the Lord, they were so full of love, they were so full of the Spirit, they just said, you know what? We don't want anybody to suffer. We want everybody to be equal. We want to make sure that everybody's bills are paid, that everybody's got the, you know, food to eat, the same amount of food. It, was, it came from a great heart. I mean, can you imagine how on fire the very first church after Jesus was here, how on fire they were? And so this is the church that Jesus basically established, if you will, uh, and we're still a part of that, but the beginning of it. And so when they did this and the Lord established them, they, they, they wanted to make sure that everybody was well taken care of. So they said, let's do this. Everybody bring in everything they have and let's give it to the leaders of the church and they'll distribute it to everybody as they have need. Remember that was the whole thing with Ananias and Sapphira. They lied about what they gave and what they didn't give and all these things that happened. Now, God didn't ask them to do that. The Bible doesn't say that you're supposed to take everything you have, bring it into the church, and then allow the church leadership divided up between the body, how much salary you get, how much food you get, here's your gas bill, here's your whatever. But that's exactly what the early church did. They basically set up what we would call today a socialistic society. And that is all the money was brought in 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 a single pool and was distributed to the people. But the problem that you have in socialism is the same problem they had back then. You eventually run out of money. It doesn't work. And so the early church went broke. And so they didn't have any money left. It was completely, and so Paul said, all right, now the, early, the Jerusalem church, these guys took good care of us spiritually. We need to now help them physically. So Paul began traveling all over Asia and ever collecting money for the church in Jerusalem. So they said to him, look, you need to take care of the poor. Uh, and we want you to do that. And as long as you continue to do that, uh, then we're happy. And that'll be the thing that we ask to do. And Paul says, yep, I'll do that. I want to do that. That's always something I have wanted to do. And so Paul again went into that venture. Now, Before we finish today, because we looked at what happened here as Paul is making this argument about what happened, I want to finish today by reading what happened. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 15. Back to your left, and we're going to read about the very thing that Paul is writing about here in Galatians. Because this is the time that Paul went back to the church there in Jerusalem, fought against these legalists, fought to make sure that they had freedom in Christ established and what the requirements were going to be for the Gentiles because they were going to the Jews, he was going to the Gentiles. And now we see Paul's argument uh, in action here of what he's talking about in Galatians. The book of Galatians is a good reminder of what really matters. It's a book about being freed from your sinful lifestyle, and that freedom will open up the world to you so you can walk in God's will for your life unhindered. Now, that doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want, because we all know that will take you to a place away from God. But the closer you get to Jesus, you'll notice your thinking and desires will change for the better. If you're truly seeking Him in all things and walking in a way that pleases Him, you end up being freed up from what's holding you back. As Pastor Mark reminds us, Knowing and following Jesus is life-changing. Some people think that they have to give up everything they really enjoy if they commit to Christ, but that's exactly the opposite. Whatever God asks you to lay down is because it's harmful or hurtful. He always replaces it with something better. All you need to do is surrender to Jesus and trust that He'll take care of the rest. We realize it might not seem that easy in your head or heart, so please reach out to us if you have questions. You can connect at thewaymedia.net by clicking on the Come to the Table section 
or give our church office a call at 865-609-1385. Again, that's 865-609-1385. We hope you'll take that leap of faith into a more fulfilling life, and we hope you'll join us for more expository truths for the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.